Okay. So I'm just going to reread that epistle reading from Sundays, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we will all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogance, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, and he is not yet known as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And this actually does have some application for what we're doing uh, with Hebrews when we consider uh, some of the things we've talked about, about Jewish converts to Christianity. You know, they've been raised Jewish. They've been raised to live their lives a certain way. And now you've got all these Greek speakers becoming Christians and they do things different and it's confusing. So how do you reconcile that with with something you've been raised your whole life to do, and now you don't have to do it. So we're going to look real quick, before we start talking about it, we're going to look at Peter's dream, which is Acts chapter 10. Chapter 10, chapter 9, chapter 10. Mm -hmm. Chapter 9, chapter 10. Peter's vision, Mm -hmm. 10, 10, verse 9. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by the four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer call consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate, and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you, but get up, come downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. And it goes up, goes on like that. Uh, and, and it tells the story of him going to Cor- Cornelius' house, which is not important. The, what that actually says is a whole other story. The point is he went into the home of this non-Jew and ate what they ate which is the point of his, his dream. And the whole point of all of that is this difference between the ceremonial law and the moral law. And I need to... Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so we got these two kinds of law, and they overlap. So you've got... Really? Yeah. My very carefully constructed Venn diagram showing the intersection of the two sets, the moral and ceremonial law. But there's an overlap where they both might have something. So we'll look at the moral law. The, the reason for the ceremonial law is because the Jews didn't keep the moral law. So God gave them the law around the law because they didn't keep the moral law. They had to keep the ceremonial laws in order to be forgiven for their breaking of the moral law. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so you have all these new uh, regulations, we'll call them, because they weren't able to keep the Ten Commandments, so they had to do things to make satisfaction for, for those sins, which is where you get you know sacrifices and and that kind of thing, sin offerings. So were they making up for what they couldn't keep? Right, so they, so they couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. So they're given the, the ceremonial law for other reasons too. But those ceremonies are that by which they can atone for their sins of the moral law. Okay, so they bring their sacrifices and the Levites would offer the sacrifices on their behalf for their sins, the sin offering, drink offerings, wave offerings. All that stuff in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Uh, but where they cross, then you have a problem. And we have a big problem, I see, in American evangelical, American evangelicalism in this country r right now. Because you have very well-meaning, I think, Christians that completely get this wrong. And they think, oh, we have to keep all that stuff in the Old Testament. It's like, no, you don't. Only where it intersects the moral law. And you notice these groups, some of the fringe groups, well, they pick and choose what they decide is important. For example, the big one is, because they're an easy target, Westboro Baptist Church, God hates bags, right? Okay, we've all seen them on TV, protesting funerals for soldiers uh, because they're you know better than everybody else because they keep the ceremonial laws. Because... What does the Old Testament say about homosexuality? It's an abomination before the Lord. You shall take them outside the city gates and stone them to death with stones. We don't do that. And it's not because we're a more evolved society. It's because that law does not apply to us. Only in as much as it applies to us in the fifth commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery, which is any kind of sexual sin, uh, whether it be homosexual, heterosexual, monosexual, whatever, whatever you conceive of. So, yeah, homosexuality is still a sin, but we are not directed to take them out and kill them for it, right? Just like we are not directed to go out and take the life of an adulterer, which is, was another part of ceremonial law. If you caught them in adultery, you had to take them out and stone them also. That does not apply to us because... Christ is the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. When Christ came, the reason all the Jews had to do all this stuff throughout all the centuries is because it made them different from everybody else. So they had weird dietary laws. They had weird clothing laws. They had weird hairstyle laws. You know, don't wear garments of these two types of threads touching each other. You know, don't cook an animal in its mother's milk. I mean, all these things that you wouldn't even think twice about. Some of them were for their protection, like don't eat shellfish because shellfish absorbs toxins. You know, so that was for the protection of the group as they're wandering around. But we can eat all of the bacon and oysters and shrimp we want, uh, which was the point of Peter's dream. Uh, because Peter was one who 
He, he was raised Jewish all his life. He'd never known anything else. He's never eaten anything unclean until he receives this vision and says, okay, all that stuff is clean. Don't call it unclean anymore. If I say it's clean, it's clean, which meant he could go conscience-free, go into this Gentile former uh, pagan's home, a Gentile Christian, and sit with them and eat a meal and not have to worry about what he was eating. And we see Jesus doing that in his ministry. We see him begin to unravel the ceremonial law. You know, but we pick and choose things from that law too. Like, oh, we shouldn't work on Sundays. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day. Yes, you're supposed to have a day of rest from your labor. Um, yes, you are supposed to worship because what are you going to do on your day of rest? It sounds like a good day to go to church. You know, but it never says for us that you can't work on that day. It never says that. Uh, but uh, that is one of the things people try to pick and choose. They try to pick and choose stuff out of here because they somehow think that is making them an authentic Christian or a better Christian than you or whatever. And it's all just busy work, basically. I mean, it's like, to me, it's like fasting. I mean, Jesus doesn't say, you know, if you fast, you should do this. He says, when you fast, you should do this. So we should fast once in a while. But it's not something we're doing for him. You know, it's like, it's not when we're fasting that we are doing that to make atonement for sins or make satisfaction of sins. It's nothing like that. It's preparing your body to know how to deal with things when you don't have enough food to eat. That's, it's training. That was the point of fasting. It still is. So that in the event the church is persecuted, and it comes to that again. Uh, we're not going to go, oh, no, you know, I can't go to McDonald's. I'm hungry. You know, you can skip a meal or skip a day. You know how to do that. You know how to go hungry. Uh, that's the point of fasting. It's a fine bodily training, as Luther says. And you can use it for devotional purposes, too, because when you fast, it makes your mind sharp, you know. Plus, using your brain helps take your mind off your empty stomach, too. Uh, so they have their uses, but they're for us. They're our uses. They're for what we're trying to accomplish, nothing that we're doing for God. I need to ask a question. Sure. Um, fasting and prayer. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, um, I need help on where, in regards to casting up demons. Oh, this type of... Not... Yeah, this type will only go with uh, prayer. Uh so why John, that? it's the sending of the 72. And around the sending, it must be in Luke. Luke. That, that's a hard passage. Oh, I, I don't mean to put us on the rabbit trail. It's just you were saying that fasting was just for training. But I, I always thought it also was, it had a spiritual connotation when you were really needing to focus on spiritual things that are super important. Well, we can use it to that end, and that, that, that you know, would, would, would help us in the event it helps us. It's, it's a good thing to do if it gives you that clarity and focus. Okay. Luke 10. Luke 10, let's have right about Luke. I just went right past it. So. Okay, I can accept that because uh, uh, I was praying and was wondering what to do in regards to our, our youngest who was adopted has attachment issues. And it was, I was, I'd sought all kinds of help. And I just told the older two, I said, I'm going to fast today. I'm going to read my Bible and this is how it's going to be today because I really need to hear from God. And it helped a lot. It just, it helped me focus. So maybe that is all that I needed. No. Oh, Mark nine twenty nine. So Mark nine twenty nine. Uh, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer in brackets and fasting. Uh, the this is a good example of one of those things where the manuscripts are different, uh, and the and I'm going to use the word better. Uh, the 
the better manuscripts, the better attested manuscripts do not have and fasting. It just says by prayer. Um, and that's one of the things we have to struggle with sometimes is when they make decisions with some of these translations, uh, how do they do that? One of the ways they do that is they look at all the manuscript evidence. They look at what's the oldest and they let the oldest have more weight than the newer manuscripts for, you know, changes that might have slipped in. And also, it's whichever is the more difficult reading is the one that is the preferred reading. So whichever one is harder to read is probably the correct one. Because the tendency was for things to get softened over time. That's a mm, explanation, but that's the behind the scenes in the world of Bible translating in ancient manuscripts. Well, this could have been a translation by some kind of monk or devotee that was like, well, I pray and fast. Don't they go hand in hand? Yeah, it's like, well, you, you, can't, ha you can't pray without fasting. Yeah. That kind of stuff happened all the time. And it sounds weird to us to talk about it, but the truth is they're so good at this science of paleography that they can recognize monk's handwriting on some of this stuff. They know where it came from, who it came from in certain cases. Uh, I trust them to know what they're talking about, <laughs> honestly, with all these variations. Uh, so if you look it up in the Greek New Testament, this one doesn't have the full, this one doesn't have any of the apparatus. Though. If you look it up in a, in a proper, that's a reader's edition, uh, if you look it up in the proper uh, uh, edition of the Greek New Testament, it's got what's called the apparatus in it. It tells you every variation that exists, and it lists them. So it'll say right there at the end of that verse, and it'll go, you know, this man, specific manuscript has this, this manuscript has that. So it's not hidden in any way. It's not hidden at all. Uh, but you don't see any of that stuff when we only read in English. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's the big difference between the ceremonial and the moral law. So when Jesus came, all that ceremony goes out the window. Uh, because he's the fulfillment. Because he is he's the fulfillment. So he's the reason all that stuff existed. Is to point, this is where the Messiah will come. Now he's here, and now that stuff's done. We don't need you don't need to be a unique people anymore. It, that, all that went away. I have another note I don't want to talk about. But like Jesus himself said that, you know, think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. Uh, and he's talking about the moral law there. <coughs> Okay, so the, the, the ceremonial law that includes all the holy days, that includes all the feasts, all the festivals, all that stuff that they did. Um, and so what does that got to do with eating food sacrificed to idols? Well, so what, what Paul was talking about people eating this food sacrificed to idols was all right, you're going to go with your buddy who's a pagan and he's stopping off the temple and, you know, oh, they're having sacrifice. So the people eat the sacrifice. So he's eating food, sacrificed to idols, and his Christian buddy goes, well, I don't believe that that's actually God. So it's not really sacrifice to a God because it's not a God. He doesn't exist. So I'm going to go eat too. And they have Christian freedom to do that. There's, It's okay. But... You have another buddy who just became Christian. He used to be pagan. He believes that what that guy's doing by eating food sacrificed to that idol is wrong because he used to do that. He used to be one of them, and it offends his conscience. Dealing Well, now that's our magical word, adiaphra. You know, you're free to do things as long as you don't cause a brother to stumble. Uh, but just because you're free to do a thing doesn't mean you should do that thing especially when it burdens your neighbor's conscience. So just like, and I'm going to keep ranting about chanting, uh, 
Why I don't chant? Because I've got a couple people in the congregation that don't like that. They think it's Catholic. It's too Roman Catholic. It offends their conscience. One of them will not come to church if I do it. So I don't do it because it offends this person's conscience. I cannot just say, well, I'm the pastor. I can do whatever I want. Technically, yeah. But that's not the best solution here. The best solution here is to not introduce something that's new that people aren't used to without teaching. Uh, it's kind of like every Sunday communion. You know, we in the LCMS have churches that every time you are in church, you have the Lord's Supper, which is great. That's what our confessions say we do. But we don't do that. Why? Because over a couple centuries here in the United States, we lost doing that. And various reasons have come up about why people think you shouldn't do it every week. Uh, one being it's not special anymore. Uh, and for that reason, that really burdens people's consciences. So you can't just come in and go, oh, by the way, I'm an every Sunday communion guy, boom, and do it. Without teaching, you have to work toward this. Uh, and sometimes that takes up to 20 years to, to change something like that. So that when you're talking about tiptoeing on, around consciences, you're talking about a significant dedication of time to do things slowly because you don't have to do it. You know, you don't just because you can do it doesn't make it right because you're burdening somebody. Um, and that's important. If you cause someone to stumble, then you are in error. Uh, and that has to do with anything that's not commanded or forbidden. And that's what that word adiaphor means. Adiaphor means indifferent things. So uh, the pastor chants or he doesn't chant. Uh, the pastor genuflects during the words of institution or doesn't. And honestly, the first time I ever saw that in a Lutheran church, I went, wow, that's pretty Catholic right there. But yet there are Lutheran churches where that happens every Sunday. So that's the, uh, when you're saying the, uh, when you have a freestanding altar, I believe it is actually, yeah. Yeah, it's when you do the creed right before the words of institution. I'm trying to remember how they do that. Anyway, the pastor gets down on his knees. He's holding on to the altar and he completely goes down on his knees and comes back up, which, well, Lutherans don't really do that, so it looks strange. Uh, but everybody that grew up in that church is like, yeah, that's what you do. I'm surprised you don't do it when they go someplace else. Like, why don't you do that? Okay, those kind of things are things neither commanded nor forbidden. They're ceremonies, they have meanings, but, you know, it's not, it's not in here. Uh, what kind of wine should we use for the Lord's Supper? So it got to be red, white, rosé. Everybody has an opinion about that, by the way. Uh, what kind of bread? Should it be one loaf? Should we break it? How come when we say the words in the tissue, we don't? Jesus said on the same day, we took bread and broke it. Why don't we break it when we do that? Some Reformed churches do. Lutherans don't. Again, neither commanded nor forbidden, but... All these things over the centuries, things happened, and there's reasons you do and don't do them. Like, for example, uh, with the breaking of the bread at the, Lord, at the Lord's Supper, like that's what the big hosts are for. Uh, why don't we Lutherans do that? Because the Calvinists started doing, they started doing that because it was, see, there's no blood. It's not flesh. It's not the body of Christ. So it was in defiance of the real presence that they did that. Therefore, we don't do that because that's why they do it. Silly, right? But it teaches something. Well, our daughter goes to a Lutheran church. It's not a uh, Missouri Synod, but uh, for their communion, they before the pandemic. Now, I'm mm -hmm. sure they don't do this now, but uh, during their communion, they had an actual loaf of bread, mm -hmm. and the pastor would pull out. Yep pieces of bread and, and give it to the, uh, the people who came the, the church I was confirmed in did that. In fact, they had a lady who baked a special loaf of bread for Sunday for that. And this is a special loaf, too, mm -hmm. uh, that they use. Uh, it's just a, a little right. different. Yeah, everybody's got a little different practice, but, you know, uh, whole wheat, white, rye, pumpernickel. Unleavened. Unleavened, leavened. Uh, you know, white, red, rosé. Guess what? Jesus didn't tell us. So guess what? It's not important. Just got to be wine. Just got to be bread. 
Uh, but okay, well, what about? I mean, we're not turning this in about the Lord's Supper. Why is it too sour? <laughs> yeah, there have been a couple of times that they go bad. They go bad if you don't use them enough. Use them up. Yeah. Yeah, we had a few Sundays in years gone by where everybody blinked twice after they. Actually, like, it was that vinegar or was that wine? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a funny story from a guy that was a year behind me in the seminary. And we're sitting in uh, the, the year he had the Lord's Supper class. We were in a different class, but I was like giving them hints. It's like, oh, you can get Dr. Masaki off on a tangent when there was like a four hour class in the afternoon. I said, you can really easily get him off on a tangent for like an hour and a half. Here are the questions. <laughs> and I gave him the list. This is how you derail it if you guys want to take a break. It's like, okay. So we got him to, to talk about, you know, the bread and issues around Adi Afra and the Lord's Supper. And he said, well, and he had a good one because he, w- he went to chapel that morning and we had the Lord's Supper. And he goes, you know, I had, he goes, I paused because the wafer wasn't stale. It tasted like bread and he was shocked and it, he forgot that it was the body of Christ. He was being half serious, but he kind of meant what he said. He goes, it was distracting to him because he's so used to it not tasting like bread. He just thinks body of Christ. No, all he could think was bread because it was fresh and it tasted good. I said, you got you said you really said that in class. He goes, Yes, I did. Like, okay. But yeah, it's funny how those things uh, that are not commanded or forbidden, you can have a very strong opinion about and cause a lot of problems. I mean, like the only bigger things you can cause problems in a church on is deciding to change the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. Because that <laughs> That is going to be warfare. Uh, seriously. But that's the big difference between ceremonial and moral. So the ceremonial was designed by God for those who cannot keep the moral law, which is everybody, so that they would have this system to, to you know, make satisfaction for sins. Also, it protected them. That's all those other ceremonial laws, like the go show yourself to the priest because you got a spot. And all this, if it's got a hair going this way, it's like, have you ever read that stuff? But it all had a purpose because that was to keep an outbreak from, from spreading throughout the camp, right? So all that stuff had a purpose, but then once Jesus came, that purpose is gone. You know, he kept that law perfectly. We no longer need it. So I don't know if you had any questions about that stuff, but that answers answer some of them but we see that we see that a lot you'll see that in news articles uh, if you like kind of it might not be the subject of the article but you'll see these people from some of these churches that are just clinging to the ceremonial law like if you don't do this you can't call yourself a real christian it's like no if you don't do that you can't call yourself a real jew <laughs> it's got nothing to do with christianity whatsoever only this stuff so again like if it's on both it's only the part that applies to the moral law that has anything to do with us. So again, you know, homosexuality is a sin. So is cheating on your wife. And so is not listening to your mom when she tells you to make the bed. And guess what? In the moral law, that has one punishment, death, eternal damnation. There are no shades of gray with God when it comes to the law. So, yeah. Yeah. So all of that ceremonial stuff does not apply to us. And We're Peter talking about stoning, uh, you know, in those instances. Well, one day we were talking about she has a high school class, and uh, they meet once a year, you know, the, the reunion, reunion kind of like. And we were talking about uh, the sexual business and pedophiles and all that kind of stuff. And this one fellow's got an Asian woman for a wife. And she spoke up and said what they do with them over there. Is they walk them out in the ocean with a weighted belt. They don't even monkey with them. They just, okay. if they're convicted of that and they know that they're, they're guilty, they just walk them out in the ocean with a weighted belt. And they do that. Hmm. So, you know. Crazy. 
the different cultures. Yeah, very much. Well, it's the same thing with, uh, especially in Paul's letters, because sometimes it's like, is, does he talk about anything other than circumcision? Because it seems like he just goes on about that for a while. And, you know, the reality is you have to look at what letter it is that he's writing. If it's one of the pastoral letters, like to Timothy or to Titus, okay, so that's from elder pastor to younger pastor. This is how, how to stay out of trouble kind of stuff, but... You know, that was the same thing, too. The, the literal circumcision was an outward sign because, you know, men bathed together. They saw each other. They were exercised together. They saw each other without their clothes on. So everybody was just kind of like, ah, he's a Jew. <laughs> There's no mistaking that, right? Uh, but then again, when Christ came, they don't have to do that anymore. Yet, Paul had Timothy circumcised before he went to some Jewish converts so as not to offend them. Um, again, that's kind of a, that would be a, you know, something that's made a stumbling block for them because, you know, they're born, they're, you know, from the eight to eights after they're born, this happens. And then uh, that does mark them as, as different from everybody else. But once Jesus came, he is the true sacrifice, true sacrifice, the true new covenant. So that bloodletting that took place no longer applies because he was the final, uh, the final offering. Any questions? I just wanted to cover that because it comes up. This comes up with with talking about keeping the law in the epistles a lot. You have to look at it. Is he talking about the ceremonial law? Or is he talking about the moral law? Which, of course, Jesus kept both perfectly. But the, the ceremonial law does not apply. But they may talk about the ceremonial law as a foreshadowing of what Christ has done. And so we have to be aware of that, too. So it can get confusing talking about the law and you're no longer under the weight of the law or you are no longer a slave to the law. What law is he talking about? Uh, and then looking at types again. So you have uh, the big one being the Passover, right? So the Passover, the whole thing with the Passover is a type pointing forward to Christ's sacrifice. So all those lambs point forward to the greater once for all sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. Uh, so now you no longer have to keep the Passover. Which again, a lot of well-meaning Christians are doing that. They have Passover services on Monday, Thursday, and that's maybe not the most helpful thing to do. It's neat from a historical perspective. Find a Jewish friend and go to their house and do it. <laughs> Don't do it in church. Uh, well, just lately, they had a, we were talking about there was something going on in Israel that the Orthodox Jews were going nuts and the rest of them didn't know what to do with them. Yeah, that happens a lot, actually. The the Orthodox Jews are actually the minority, but they hold a lot of power in government over there. So it's it makes their politics very confusing and very complicated. But yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of folks, a lot of churches that will do a Passover seder, and it's like why? I mean, it's neat from a historical perspective, but why do that in church? We did it once here. Oh, it must have been about 20 years ago, uh, involving the Sunday school. Okay. Uh, and it, it was very nice. The parents came too. We had quite a nice attendance. Did they do it in the sanctuary or did they like do it out here? Yeah, yeah, see, that's different. Well, these people are doing it in the context of worship. And it's like, yeah, we got something a little bit more applicable and important to be doing on this night than that. So seriously, if you have a Jewish friend that's somewhat orthodox and still keeps us up, go to their house for Passover. It's neat. Uh, my roommate in high school was Jewish. He was like Jewish like three days a year. He wasn't really practicing, but Passover, his family kept Passover pretty strict. So I went to his house and it was really neat. I mean, it's elaborate. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot going on in every motion and every word has meaning. So it's a neat experience, but we don't need to, we don't need to do that. My wife and I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to actually attend the Messianic Passover Seder, which was... That could be interesting. It was, because 
we were pretty much in a room full of messianic Jews, and they kept the Passover mm -hmm. as dictated through the eons, but the focus was on Christ. Right. Because and the Passover initially in Exodus points to what Christ did on the cross. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they kept the Passover with the lamb shank, the, the, the four cups, yep, yep. The, the, the matzah, the whole nine yards. But they always kept the perspective of yeah. Jesus. And it's interesting to see Peter heading down that road. Because mm -hmm. you look at him and go, oh, he's like a Messianic Jew. You know, he wants to keep all the ceremonies. And, you know, Paul's just saying, you know, no, you don't have to do that. It's going to confuse people. But, yeah, that's what they do. Is they're, So basically they're Christian with a Jewish, strong Jewish identity, so they keep all that stuff. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to keep kosher, keep kosher. Knock yourself out. There's nothing that commands or forbids you from doing that. And besides, food from Jewish deli is awesome. I mean, that's, that's some of the best food around. Uh, same thing if you want to keep Islamic food laws, you know, the uh, uh, halal. It's, they have to kill things a certain way, and their food's awesome. It's very different from ours. Knock yourself out if you want to keep that, but it doesn't, remember, it doesn't earn you anything. It's just a dietary thing you've chosen to do. It's like, it's like choosing to do a keto diet or Atkins or whatever. It's a choice. But, and it is kind of neat that they keep that cultural identity that way. I mean, I think they do keep the two things, you know, they're Jewish by identity, so this is what we do to mark us as Christians of Jewish descent. Can't really fault them for that. That's kind of a neat way to handle it. Okay. That's enough about that. But that comes up all the time in the epistles. Uh, we're going to see it in Hebrews, talking about the law particularly. Um, I did not get an opportunity to go through and cherry pick out a bunch of verses where that happens, but we will, we will see that. Um, so let's go into Hebrews a little bit, so we do have time. And we still haven't gone over Hebrews 2, 5 to 18. We will, I promise. But we do have a couple of topics to finish talking about first. Uh, this idea of Jesus as the merciful high priest and then us as brothers of Christ, how we are co-priests with Christ in Hebrews. And that is a big, big theme. And if we can get our minds wrapped around that in the right way, the rest of the letter will be a lot easier for us. So we're going to talk about Jesus as high priest in contrast to the high priests in the Old Testament. Okay. So the first comparison is the order of the priesthood. And some of these are tenuous to, to, have, to number them out like this, but... Uh, the first one is the order of the priesthood. So you have the Old Testament Levitical priests, uh, and they're in the order of Aaron. So if you look at Hebrews 7.11, says, Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, uh, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? So Christ is the royal priest in the order of Melchizedek. That's in 510. Uh, it just says, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And then 620. Let me know if I'm going too fast with these. You don't actually have to look them up, these verses. I'll try to get a printout for you guys. But I'm just bring, introducing the topics as kind of like a, a heading. Uh, so 620 says where Jesus entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And then 711, uh, which I already read. And then uh, the author of Hebrews gives us a summary 
really, of, of the whole incident with uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. So it's chapter 7, verse 1. Let's look at that real quick. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was, first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning nor of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So Melchizedek's a pretty enigmatic figure. Uh, did he really have you know, no beginning or no end of his days? Is he a, uh, a theophany? Is that one of the manifestations of the second person of the Trinity in our world? I love those because there's so many of them in the Old Testament. They're wonderful. This is not one, I don't think. I think that that is just king language, speaking of uh, him having no beginning or end of days. Uh, again, this is one of those figures where there's only like three verses about him in the Old Testament, and people have written books about it. And you read one and it convinces you one way, and the next day it convinces you the other way. So I flip-flopped on this theophany issue. And I don't know. It seemed pretty strange if the second person of the Trinity made manifest in our world so that Christ could point back to himself as being a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which would be himself if it was a theophany. So, no, that's self-referential, and the Bible doesn't really do that. That's my, the main argument against it. Uh, but he's a king, and he's a priest. So he is a type pointing directly to Christ for sure, because Christ is our king, as we talked about at length last time, and he's our great high priest, which uh, David was. Sort of, but not as great as either Melchizedek or Christ. So if we have to look at, that's what I forgot to talk about. So if we look at 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, One day I'll be able to do this without looking stuff up, but not today. Because this goes with... Is it after David becomes king? So you're referring to it before? I'm pretty sure he's king. Then that would be second Samuel. I just read this before we came here tonight. That's the sad part. <sighs> David goes and eats the showbread. Where is it? Second Samuel, first Samuel. It's got, he doesn't become king until Second Samuel. Very. Yeah, I know, but I'm not sure he was king or not yet. Oh. That's why I'm asking. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 12. Do, 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 do. Have you not read that, David? 12 3. So that is. First Samuel twenty one six. I was close. Okay, so First Samuel twenty one six, and this goes directly to talking about the laws a little bit. So twenty 
21. Yeah, so 1 Samuel 21 says, Then David came to Nob, came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? David said to Amalek the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter in which I am sending you and with which I have commissioned you, and I have directed the young men to a certain place. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, There is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women, David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out, and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was an ordinary journey. How much more than today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from the place before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. So you see... You see David doing kind of priestly things. So he's going to eat, he and his men are going to eat the showbread, which is there that was only for the priests to eat. Um, and as Jesus points out, you know, it was not counted against him. He didn't break any law doing that. Um, but it's kind of a gray area because the priests were going to take the bread away and then they put the fresh bread out every Sabbath. And then it sits there for a week. And then the priest ate it when it was like a week old and stale. So he gave him that. Uh, was it a Sabbath day? We're not sure. There are uh, some scholars that say yes. So David's not even like, it's not like he took the showbread off the table of the presence and ate it. It's like the priest was going to be taking it off anyway. So, oh yeah, you can eat that as long as you're not unclean. Um, and that points forward again to Christ as our great high priest who, you know, he is the the you know the the clean vessel he is the the lamb without blemish uh, and he is the bread of life who is given to us to eat uh, so it's not just for the priests it's for everybody you know this is my body take and eat okay so that was kind of a went a little sideways but okay so the, you have the old testament levitical priests after the order of aaron but christ is after the order of Melchizedek, which Melchizedek being a strange figure, but he is a king, the king of righteousness. Melchizedek means righteousness. The king of peace, Salem means peace. So the king of Jerusalem, right? Yet he came out to Moses. Kings don't do that. He came out to Moses and gave him bread and wine. The symbolism is not lost on us. Uh, because that's what you gave people. And that's why Jesus used it at the Last Supper, because that's what would be on the table. Everybody's table is going to have bread and wine. So this king, this priest, comes out and feeds Moses. Or I keep saying Moses. Abraham. Why do I do that? He comes out and feeds Abraham with the, with the bread and wine. And then we see Christ, who is our great king, which we've talked about, and now we're seeing he is our great high priest, which we've talked about a little bit, and we're getting ready to talk about it more, who feeds us. He comes to us and feeds us bread and wine, his body and blood. So he is a high priest forever after the type of Melchizedek, who is priest and king. The priest and king who came out to serve, specifically. Jesus came to serve. Okay. And then you have covenants that were entered. Okay, so if we look at, back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8-ish, 8, chapter 8, 7. Which he is quoting at length from all over the place. He's quoting from all over Leviticus, Jeremiah, Deuteronomy. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant. 
with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. On that day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Okay, so you have the the foundational covenant where God declares them to be, once again, his people. But then you have a newer, greater covenant. And we have to back up for that. Chapter 8, verse 6. But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. And then look at 722. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a greater covenant. Uh, And that chapter 7 and chapter 8, when we get to that, we're going to talk about the the old covenant, the new covenants. We'll talk about Melchizedek again. We'll talk about this new, better ministry that Christ entered into, greater than the ministry of the priests. So we still have a foundational covenant. You know, God made a covenant with his people of old, and in Christ he makes a covenant with the people of the new era. And that begins on the evening of Monday, Thursday, right? Take and drink. This cup is the New Testament, new covenant of my blood. Because when blood is shed, a covenant is cut. That's what the word covenant actually means. So when they would literally cut a covenant, they would take like a sheep and they would cut it in half. And the two parties would walk through it and get covered in blood. Blood had to be shed for a covenant to uh, be a covenant. And, of course, Christ's blood on the cross sealed the new covenant. Uh, And that's why the circumcision thing, too, because blood had to be shed. We entered, entered into a covenant with him. Okay. And then we look at the, so we know the order of the priesthood. We know the foundational covenant of the priesthood. And then we have to look at the institution of the priesthood. So in the Old Testament, that would be the law of Moses. And then in the New Testament, we have the better promises made in Christ. And it's the same verses we just looked at. So we see the foundation of the covenant, the institution of the promises. But then we have the installation into the priesthood. So just like we have pastors get installed, they get ordained and installed. Uh, The priests in the Old Testament had to be installed. And we looked at some of that at length last time. We talked about all of the procedures they had to go through for this seven-day procedure to become a priest. And then Christ was appointed, of course, by, you know, divine oath. We look at 510, uh, being designated by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, again. Then 721 to 28. He, with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord is sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all when he was offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. So we see the connection now from the beginning of Hebrews. It's like, why is it going on and on about how Jesus was made lower than angels and then higher than angels? Because the point that got beaten into us is because the father claims this is my son. Now my son is your high priest and he is your king. 
And so all the pieces come together. Not that we really wondered about that before, but, but the author of Hebrews takes all of this doctrine apart and puts it back together for us and carries it through the Old Testament. Because remember, they don't have, I mean, they have the Gospels are being written uh, at this time, but really when they are reading the Bible in church, they're still reading the Old Testament. And he's connecting all the dots through all those prophecies and all of these events that, that foreshadowed the coming of Christ. He's putting all these pieces together. And the way this book is scattered throughout the church here, you don't make these connections. And it's just like, okay, yeah, I mean, we've, a lot of these verses, you've heard them in church. You've heard them in parts of liturgy, but you never really thought about how they all connect. I didn't think about it because you don't really sit until you read the book straight through. And it's like, oh, yeah. And it just gives you a better appreciation for our, for this whole tapestry of scripture, how it's all, you know, you, it's wove and it's wove tight and you can't pull, you know, if you pull on a tapestry and you yank a thread out of it, you ruin the picture because it just, it just makes it look terrible. <coughs> One thread running through it, you can tell if it's been pulled on or someone's played with it because it just ruins the illusion. You can't do that in scripture. There's not one thing you can yank on and get it to come loose. As much as people like to think you can, but they can't. Okay, so our fourth point was the duration of service, which we just talked about. Okay, so in the Old Testament, it is temporary and it's impermanent because priests die because they are sinners too. So they are going to die. However, Christ is eternal. He died once. He will never die again, as the author of Hebrews said. Uh, therefore, he is our high priest forever. And then the next point comparing the priests of the Old Testament with Jesus is their personal potency as priests. Personal potency as priests. Uh, so in the Old Testament, you again have mortal men. They have mortal weaknesses, human weaknesses. Uh, but Jesus is ever living. And so because he has this indestructible life, uh, he never loses efficacy. He's always this Christ the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, right? He's never going to change. He's unchanging. Uh, men, have you ever seen an old, uh, an old pastor that's just kind of maybe should have hung it up a couple years ago? Because you know, they don't want to retire. I mean, this is what they do, but they're maybe not as effective as they used to be. You still love them, but they're not as effective as they might have been uh, because they're old and tired because we're hu they're human. You can only do this. It's, you, you know, you could be a steel worker, too, and be a great steel worker. And if they don't tell you, you got to go home, <laughs> you're dangerous. They'll go to work every day, and they're not as good a steel worker because they're not as strong as a young man. Uh, it's the same thing with this. You know, the weakness of the flesh brings all things to an end. Okay? And then the sixth point about the difference between the Old, Old Testament priests and Christ is, of course, the location. Okay, the High priesthood in the Old Testament is in the temple, in the tabernacle, on earth. Christ is at the right hand of God in heaven. So that is where the seat of that priesthood is. So we see, okay, the Lamb of God who was slain and is yet alive, we see in Revelation, sitting right there in the throne room of God at the right hand. So you have, you know, you have the sacrifice who is alive. The king has taken his rightful place at the right hand of the father. And now you see the priest in the heavenly temple. So you see the son, the king, and the priest, all three of those things in the heavenly temple, which he then brings to us through word and sacrament. And then we have the, they talk about the shrine or the tent. You know, we, you know, men built the tents to live in in the desert. Uh, they built the tabernacle. God told, directed them to build the tabernacle to have a place for him to dwell with them. But now that dwells in Christ. You know, he is the vessel of the tabernacle. Uh, he is the more perfect tent. He wasn't made with hands. You know, he was made, you know, from God eternal. And we'll talk about that one. That's a little abstract, but we'll get to that in, in some of the later chapters. And then again, the holy places. So we have the earthly sanctuary. That is where we've talked about that. And then we have the heavenly holy places. And that, toward the end of the book, starts focusing on that. 
And then we have liturgy, because this is, in the end, uh, this book is liturgical. It's taking us through worship in our lives, in our worship services. Uh, so there's always things that are going to have to do with liturgy. Um, so we have in the Old Testament, we have described for us what the worship service looked like, which is a copy of what's going on in heaven. So all our worship here on earth is just a copy of what is taking place in the better liturgical service taking place in the holy places, taking place in the court of God, which we have the, you know, again, Revelation has probably the most beautiful illustrations of what that looks like. And then you have the difference between the Old Testament priests. You know, they, in order of their rank, would get close to God. Uh, you know, but they were still standing before him at a distance. The high priest, once a year, could enter the most holy place and hope he didn't mess anything up so he'd live to tell about it and would actually be in the presence of God for that one time on the Day of Atonement. But then you have Christ, again, enthroned at the right hand of God in heaven. You know, so he is right there, not one day a year, from eternity until eternity, uh, never ending, never changing. And then we have offerings is another difference. So you have the priests who had to take domesticated animals and then they would offer the burnt offerings, the sin offerings, the peace offerings, as well as grain offerings. We'll get to that toward the end of the book. Well, then you have Christ, who is your king and your priest, and again, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His own body, his own flesh, is the once-for-all sacrifice, uh, the greatest sacrifice, which brings us to the last point of difference is the atonement itself. So you had to repeat these sacrifices. You didn't just do, you know, the Day of Atonement once and send the scapegoat out into the desert once and everybody's good. You had to do it again next year and the year after that. And the priests had to offer their sin offerings. We saw that with how they were consecrated as priests. And they had to keep doing that stuff periodically. They had to make themselves clean because you can't offer sacrifices on behalf of the people if you're unclean, Right. So you have sinners making right their own sins before God so that they can then represent the people to make the offerings for their sins. But now we have Christ, who is the sinless sacrifice, the single sacrifice, once for all, for all others. And then he is able to use, you know, people like me, pastors who are... Yeah, we're not perfect, not even remotely close to being perfect. And yet I can stand up there and give you the body and blood of Christ because he works through me as a vessel to give you those things. It actually has nothing to do with me other than I make the words come out of my mouth. And that's it. And then I hand it to you. That's, that's my contribution. It's got nothing to do with whether I even believe in it or not, which... People think that's a little surprising sometimes, but you can have a pastor up there that says the words of institutions and does this, all the rubrics correctly, and he can be a devil-worshipping Satanist, and you don't know it. But you're still getting the body and blood of Christ because it has nothing to do with him other than he is giving it to you as the way Christ instituted it, which is disturbing to think about, but that's, that's the point is... Uh, you don't even we don't even have to make some atonement sacrifice to get ready. Yeah, you know, we just have to do it the way Christ told us to do it, and it is done because it says it is, and that's it. So those are the differences we'll see between the earthly priesthood and the priesthood of Christ, the high priesthood of Christ, and that permeates all the way through this book. It goes all the way through to, to like chapter thirteen, believe it or not. So we'll see all these little things. You just let it tick your memory because uh, it's there and it's all part of the structure of this book, which I think is kind of cool. That's where we'll stop for tonight. And then we'll actually talk about Hebrews 2, 5 to 18 uh, next time. And then when we're taking a break for Lent.
So we'll do that for next time, and then uh, then we'll talk about us as co-priests, because especially us Lutherans, you know, you know, Luther wrote that article or book. He calls it a book. It's not very big uh, about the priesthood of all believers, and boy, did people take that out of context. <laughs> and it's not as complicated as people want to make it out to be. It's like, oh, well, you know, we're all priests, so we all get to do all these things. It's like, no, that's not what he meant. You know, but we'll talk about that. Some things, yes. Some things, no. But that's where we'll stop. But yeah, I just wanted to bring up about the the ceremonial and the moral law because, again, those things come up all the time in epistles. Uh, And it can be sometimes confusing. Like, well, should we be doing that? Or... And then sometimes it's like, yeah, we should be doing that. It's probably good for us to do that, but we don't have to. But, okay. If there are no questions, then we'll uh, end it there for tonight.